Good morning. I want to talk a little bit about the new arrangement we have up here. You know, we typically do not have uh, four sets of flowers and sell them. Are they ever alive? Uh, but today we have live flowers. And um, anybody want to take a guess on how many carnations are here? A hundred. Imagine that. And that is in honor of our brother in Christ, Saray, who has come uh, today, a day after a big party. It's been a big weekend. I don't know how many of you uh, have uh, Facebook and YouTube, but uh, the last two days, uh, you couldn't go down Missouri Avenue if you wanted to, uh, at least uh, during part of the day. On, uh, on Friday, uh, we had police and firemen all over the place and, uh, and city cars as Ray received a certificate from the mayor and the manager of the city. Uh, and uh, yesterday uh, was something else. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the, uh, 118 motorcycles going down Missouri. Uh, how do you park 118 motorcycles? Anywhere you want to is what it happened. And uh, uh, one neighbor who actually arranged for the parade uh, allowed about 50 of them to be in, in their yard. Uh, and uh, uh, Ray shook hands with more people yesterday than he could imagine. Now, what was really cool was Ray was on his go kart, his scooter, his his, uh, his his equivalent of a go uh, of a race car, uh, and uh, they the bikes were so far away they couldn't get to him. Uh, so he went to them. He got in that cart and he just started going up Missouri uh, until he come to, came to the end of the motorcycles, and then he turned around and came back down, uh, greeting everybody. We took a big picture of, uh, of everybody who was, uh, uh, or as many people as we could get on the street. Yeah, and uh, I understand that that's also on Facebook. Um, and um, then we did a prayer. And we prayed for Ray, and we prayed for everybody else who, uh, who, have, uh, who uh, is uh, just enjoying God's blessings this day. And it was a beautiful, a beautiful hour or so. And thank you, Ray, for, for inviting me. A little later on in the service, I'm going to ask Ray and Sandy to come up, and we have a couple gifts that you have given him, uh, and uh, we're going to ask you to open those. And then a little later in the service, oh, we have a little presentation that's going to take place before you come down, uh, so I'll c clue you on when to come down. And then at the very end of the service, after we have uh, said, uh, you've heard the benediction, uh, we're going to play another... Uh, a slideshow showing the pictures of Ray from his youth to, uh, to current times. And then uh, we're going to uh, have, uh, give Ray an opportunity to say a word, and then we're going to give him his own personal birthday cake. But everybody here today gets a piece of birthday cake from Ray if you go out through the fellowship hall. If you go out that way, I eat your cake. But if you go out this way, uh, there'll be a, a piece of birthday cake waiting for you. So um, uh, I look forward to, uh, to uh, celebrating your birthday with you, Ray, as we go through this service. God bless you.
Good morning. Please Good morning. join me in the call to worship. Your love, O oh God, extends to the heavens. Your righteousness is like the ever-rolling mountains. We shall feast on the abundance of your goodness, O oh God, and drink our fill of your mercy, O oh fountain of life. Let us worship God. confession. We blend our voices in common confession, O oh God. You are a hope of salvation. The apostle teaches us that there are varieties of gifts, yet we judge others because they do not fit our mold. There is one Savior, yet we mistrust those who do not believe as we do and doubt that they are led by the same Spirit. Forgive us for in many ways we serve the parts of Christ's body. Through him, reconcile us and pardon our estrangement. Remember that Christ is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. It is Christ who reconciles us, both to God in one body through the cross, through Christ's life, is assurance that you are forgiven and we join together as fellow citizens of God's household. Praise be to God. Thank you, Richard. We're now going to show a uh, short presentation.
my color too. I told my wife when I need one of those, I want a blue one. <laughs> Ray, uh, the flowers uh, try to give a, a picture of how long uh, 100 years is, and you know better than we do. Uh, but uh, as a just a small token of our love for you, we have a couple. We have a card for you, and we have a couple gifts. Uh, and uh, so, which one do you want to open first? Which one do you want Sandy to open first? I tell you. I say he likes gifts. I'm going to hold this for you. This is a photograph of the uh, latch hook that Ray made for this church. And I think uh, it's just an awesome, see? Uh, yeah. I only had one uh, stand, but I bet you Jesus would love to be laying across, against the cross. So that's where we're going to put that one. Ray, God bless you, brother. And from your family of faith, uh, just know that we love you very much. And uh, at, the, at the end of the service, we're going to come back. We're going to show the slide presentation again without the happy birthday. So everybody can see it again, and, uh, and then we'll have something else for you, okay? Happy birthday, brother. This brings back memories to me, you know. It, it, it's hard for me to bring it out because if you were ever in the service, you know you hide everything. Yeah, we do. And yep. you don't let it out. Well, before I left the Wilgerty, my mother passed away. Yep. And, I've uh, read the story. And uh, that was the last time I seen my mother. And it was the last time I seen my prayer book. I had, I had won the prayer book a, a year or so before. Uh, a girl won, won the, the Bible, and I won the prayer book. And, and Wise choice. To me, 
the prayer book was, was everything. Yeah. And when I went in the service, of course, they didn't take the prayer book. When I came home, I never found a prayer book to this day. I went through all the church and everywhere. God has heard every prayer you've ever done, brother. No. And, uh, you don't need a book for it. This, this just brings it all back. It's wonderful. Thank you. Instantly, uh, with uh, Ray and Sandy's permission and the permission of the editor, the next uh, newsletter that's going to come out is going to be the life story of Ray Sturgeon. Uh, written by Ray. Written by Ray. So, Ray, we look forward to reading that again. Will you join me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we come this day to talk about celebrations. In Scripture today, we're going to read about a spell of celebration, and we're going to experience a celebration of life here as we remember and we celebrate with Ray his hundred years of life. It all comes about because we follow you. We stay close to you and we call upon you on numerous occasions throughout our lives to, to just intercede on our behalf or on the behalf of someone we love. And Ray so eloquently tells about his life experience as he has done that. Our story of Jesus in the wedding at Canaan in Galilee tells about a simple petition made. A petition is just another word for praying to you and how it's been answered beyond anybody's imagination. It's hard to believe that we live in a world where you stand there waiting for us to call you, to talk to you, and Sometimes, as Ray wrote in his, one of his notes, we take that for granted. But we thank you for your always being there. We thank you for hearing our prayers and answering those prayers in a consistent with your will. And we have learned that as we pray very beginning and at the very end, we need to remember to thank you. Thank you for all that you do that does not require us to ask for it. The blessings you give each of us, the guidance you provide for us, the watch you have over us so that we can stay on the path. And when we get off the path, help us get back on. We pray for ourselves and we pray for others and on this one morning, Lord, we ask that you will hear our prayer for, first of all, for Betty Norman, who we found out this morning is now bedridden. Pray for her and her family as they take care of her and as she lives a different part of her life, um, not able to get up and move around as much. We pray for Rose, Rose Smith, who's going to have eye, or have surgery on, on Tuesday to take away the pain in her back. We pray for Mark, who's having problems with his eyes, persistent as they may be. He stays on the task. So we ask you to watch over all these individuals and all those who are unnamed, who need your divine guidance, who need your touch, your divine touch for whatever reason. And as we ask for this, and as we say thank you for all that you do for us, we ask that you will hear us now as we pray the prayer your Son taught us all. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings, they feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you. Your righteousness to the upright in heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Adhering to social distancing, Arsenia chose to sing that song 
uh, last week and, uh, and play it for us uh, by tape. And we thank her for her, her time and her dedication and her gift of music. Will you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, may the words that flow from this, your most fallible vessel, the hearts and the minds who hear, be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There is a small village in Spain that found out that the king of Spain was going to come visit them. The king of Spain had never visited this small village full of poor farmers who had their vineyards. The only resource they had was the wine they produced. And when they began thinking about what kind of way they could show their adoration to the king, they decided that they would all bring a portion of their yield from their vineyards and put it in a big vat and allow the king to taste the wonderful wine that comes from that village. On the morning that it came time for them to, uh, for the king to come, they brought each morning, they, each person brought their own little portion of wine and put it into the vat and mixed it up. And when the king arrived, they gave him a silver cup to drink from. And he went up and filled his cup from the spigot and took a drink of the best wine from the village. But to his surprise, it tasted like water. He wondered if there was a miracle maker in this village that was able to take wine and turn it into water. No, but the villagers knew what was wrong. You see, each of the villagers wanted to reserve their best wine for themselves. And so they determined that if they just took their portion and made it water and mixed it in with all the other good wine, no one would ever know the difference. Except the entire village thought that was a good idea. And the result was that the king was greatly dishonored because of their phony expression of adoration. In our text this morning, we are going to read how Jesus restores honor to a family and for the attendees of a wedding taking place in Canaan in Galilee. It's recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding at Canaan in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the very brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it, and when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn it knew it. The master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did in Canaan in Galilee and manifested his glory and the disciples believed in him. It's the word of the Lord and thanks be to God. Weddings at any age are important 
weddings in Jesus' day were particularly important, this wedding event is unique because in Scripture, the bride and groom are never named. You see, that's because John did not make the bride and groom the focus of the story. This is a story about asking for and getting God's help. Asking requires talking to God. You and I call that prayer. We are told that Jesus' mother Mary was there and playing a role to make sure that the wedding was a success. Now let's remember how weddings were conducted in Jesus' day. The groom's family was responsible for paying for the wedding feast. And they were expected to attain a certain level of certain standard, which included having enough wine. The bride's father hosted the feast, and he was called the master of the feast. If the standard was not met, the groom's family could actually be financially responsible for inadequately preparing for the celebration. One way that that would be they manifested would be that they ran out of wine, which would only would be a financial problem, but a huge social embarrassment. One theory about this particular wedding is that Mary was involved in the celebration because it was connected to the groom's family. This might have been Jesus' brother James, we don't know. And there's no mention of Joseph in the text, which makes us wonder if perhaps he had already died. That would explain why there was not enough wine. Mary, a widow, would have been limited in resources and probably would not have had enough funds to be able to put on a satisfactory, a proper wedding free feast. If this indeed was James's big day, she would have been expected to meet the social standards for a wedding celebration. And the fact that Jesus was there added proof that this perhaps could have been a family affair. Jesus, scripture says, came with his disciples. Now immediately before this in John, we read that Jesus is calling his first disciples. So based upon that, that text, we can assume that Simon and Peter, uh, Andrew and Philip and even Nathaniel were probably present at the wedding. John states that when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. That could have been translated as, son, please do something. You might ask why Mary would be asking Jesus anyhow. One of the explanations is that Jesus is the eldest son and at least in part is responsible for the success of this wedding celebration. Richard Hall wrote in his book, What Do You Do When the Wine Runs Out? To the Jewish people, wine symbolized joy. A Jewish rabbi would have a saying that was, without wine, there is no joy. At the wedding of Canaan, he says, the joy had run out. The statement by the mother of Jesus goes beyond simply asking for liquid refreshment for the wedding. It is symbolic of your life and our life, my life. It is a reminder of the emptiness in our life without Jesus Christ. It's a scary thing when we have no wine, when the wine runs out. There are times in our lives where metaphorically our wine does run out and our joy becomes dry. But Jesus is there if we ask, to bring that joy back. Jesus' response to his mother was blunt, and some theologians say was actually rude. Woman, what does this have to do with me? My time, my hour has not yet come. The word for woman in Greek is genie, is the word, part the source of the word we call genealogy. It is not a term of disrespect at all. It actually is considered to be a respectful and courteous way to 
uh, talk to a woman, but it's an unusual, unusual way to address one's mother. But you see, Jesus' relationship by this time had changed. He was an adult man now. He was beginning his earthly ministry, and his purpose has yet to be revealed to the world. Jesus was saying to his mother in a very respectful way that his purpose was much greater than making sure there was enough wine at the wedding. He was letting her know that he was indeed God incarnate and he would act if it was according to his will. This is the same way it is with you and me. We can pray for anything we want. We can ask the Lord for anything we want, and he will respond to our prayers consistent with his will. The promise we have is that we can ask for anything, and he will hear us, and we will have it if it is in line with what he wants for us. John recorded Jesus making the statement that my hour has not yet come. He does that at least six times within this gospel. The hour he is referring to, of course, is when he dies on the cross for your sins and my sins. Mary was not offended by what Jesus said. Instead, she looked at the servants and told them, <clears throat> do whatever he tells you. You see, she was going to trust. She was going to trust the love and the goodness of Jesus Christ. She had made her request known to him. And now she was leaving it in the hands of Jesus. And John says that there were six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, holding 20 or 30 gallons. That's a lot of water. And when you turn it into wine, that's a lot of wine. And Jesus said to his servants, Fill the jars full, and then draw some out, and take it to the master of the feast. After the master of the feast has tasted this, having no idea where it came from, he compliments the bridegroom on the best wine being saved to the end. You see, Mary's petition to her son Jesus, to her Lord Jesus Christ, had been answered. The wine was provided the best of the night. So the lesson that you and I can learn from this is that God will indeed answer our prayers, answer our petitions, and he will do even more than we ask so long as our prayers are consistent with his divine will. In his first letter, John affirms this by saying, and this is the confidence that we have towards him that if we ask for anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears that, we, if he hears that, he hears us in whatever we ask. We know that we have the requests that we have asked him for. We are promised. We are promised that if we ask for anything in accordance with God's will, he will give it to us and give it to us in abundance. And Scripture tells us some of the things that we should be asking for inconsistent with God's will. It is God's will that you and I share the gospel. And so we can pray for opportunities to do that. And we can pray for the boldness to be able to go out and preach the gospel to others. We can pray that God will give us the love for our neighbors and maybe even our enemies so that we have an urgency to go and show that love. Pastor, I had a chance to do that this morning. Early this morning, I got a call from a young girl. She and her friend and their very, very tiny baby were stranded up here on the lakefront. They had come down here at the request of a friend who disappeared on them. And now they were trying to go home. And they didn't have any money. And the car was on empty. And they had no food. We helped. We answered the call. 
providing love to that neighbor. We'll probably never see her again. She's headed back to Ohio, not fully funded by this church or this pastor, but she's on her way. But we answered her call. It is God's will that we gather as a church so we can pray that God will give us the strength and the motivation and the desire to be there faithfully and do what the church is called to do. It is God's will that we forgive one another. So we pray that God will help us to do that when necessary. Many other things that we can and should and do pray for, and if they are consistent with God's will and God's purpose, he will give us what we want. Paul told the Ephesian church that my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Jesus Christ. And he told the Ephesians, God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask and think according to the power at work within us. Jesus' mother had gone to, uh, to him and asked not for herself, but for the bride and groom and the wedding party, for the success of a wedding festival. And Jesus recognized the prayer from her heart, and he answered it. Jesus' mother was answered far beyond what he, she had asked for or what she probably even imagined he would do. But you see, God's not in the business of shortchanging his children when we ask. He will not give us what we want, but he will always give us what we need. We are in communion with our Lord. When we speak to him with confidence, we know that he will answer us in a matter that is best for us. Ray understood that. And in one of the documents that most likely will be in the newsletter, he wrote these words. I had stops and starts on building my relationship with God. That sounds a lot like most of us. I do not always spend time with him the way I should. Maybe I am trying to force the relationship, steer it in the way that I want it to go. It doesn't work. And it leads to frustration. Sounds a lot like many of us. However, each time I come to God for forgiveness, he is there for me. Each time I ask for help and guidance, he is there for me. When I cry in pain, he is there. My relationship with God is far from perfect. He has been there for me time and time again, although I have taken it for granted. God is patient and waiting for us to come to him. We ask if we give more to him, we will be, he will be there for us. If we give more to him, he will be there for us. You see, Ray, over his hundred years of life, has grown in wisdom. He probably had it a long time when he had that prayer book that he lost. Somebody else probably has that prayer book, brother, and used it for their benefit, God's way of taking care of people. He understands that God shapes our will and our desires to conform with his will and his desires for us. It's not noted here. But we do know that if we need something, we can pray. And if we keep praying, because that is the process, God will answer us so long as we are conforming to his will for us. And we just started with thank you. And we ended 
with thank you for all the things that God gives us without us asking. So thank you, God, for the love you have shown through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we sometimes take for granted. Amen. We are now going to, for the first time since the pen, uh, pandemic started, going to recite the Apostles' Creed, which is on the screen. You can stand if you would for this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. My brothers and sisters, as we come to the close of this worship, know that you walk with God and God walks with you. Jesus is by our side. The Holy Spirit is rests within us and gives us guidance. All we have to do is petition him, talk to him, Pray for him. Use whatever verb you want, but this expression is the same. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, the triune God will hear us even if we don't open our mouths, the groaning of our stomach, the words from our heart, the tears from our eyes. Speak to our God because he listens in all fashions and he hears and he responds. So long as we ask for things that are consistent with his will for us, for our good. We won't get what we want, but we indeed will get what we need. Go from here with that assurance. As you go, go knowing that the love of Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God is with you.
Could we play that slide one more time? And I have the feeling for it. The feeling is just right. I know he walks with me, he talks with me, and he knows I am his own. And we get along wonderfully, and I think if you lean on it a little bit, you're going to find it's in your goodwill to be related. Thank you. Ray, you know, social distancing, we can't go and have a party, but uh, we're going to give you a cake to take. We're going to give you a cake to take home. Forget the users. Uh, and, we're, and as you leave today, again, as I mentioned, so it's happy birthday, happy 100th birthday, Ray. Is Leslie coming over today? No. Uh, heck with her. Don't save any for her. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, you take this home, and you and Sandy enjoy your birthday cake. Know it comes from us with great love and appreciation. And uh, we'll share a piece of uh, the birthday cake, uh, the other birthday cake, as we leave. And it'll be eaten on in, in, in recognition of the love we have for you, my friend. God bless you. Those who want any cake can go that way. Those who don't like cake can go, can go the other way or just pass it by. <laughs> <laughs>